friends. Thank you for joining us. We are so excited to have you with us. Tonight we're going to be playing some awesome games, so hope you enjoy them. So the game that we are going to be playing right now is called Tissue Pull, and the objective of the game, of course, is to win. How you win is by pulling one tissue out of time out of the box until you empty the box and there are no more tissues left. And make sure that you're not pulling more than one at a time. No cheating. Let's play. Go. Oh, you can just like pull them? Oh man. Tracy's got the lead. No, she doesn't. She stumbled, she stumbled. A lot of debris. <laughs> oh, gonna win. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Down to the wire. Uh-oh. Hi everyone and welcome to the Crossroads Disabilities Ministry. If you're new here, we would love for you to subscribe to us. That way you can find out all the latest new content when it becomes available. A great way to connect with us during the week is with our Sunday School class. Our ministry hosts a 9 a.m. Sunday School class on Zoom every week. And those that sign on are able to connect with friends and learn about Jesus all live with our team. You can find the link to join that Sunday School class right here below. That's not all though. We also have a ministry Facebook group. Those that join our Facebook group are able to connect with friends within the ministry in many different ways. And it is a great resource for you to find out all the latest news about what our ministry is doing. You can also find that link right here below. But next is our pastor, Jennifer Felix, as she continues her series, Be Blessed, Eight Ways to Sunday. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us here again. As Andy mentioned, I'm Pastor Jennifer Felix. Today we're continuing on, tonight we're continuing on with the Beatitudes, with the next one being from Matthew 5, 6, which is blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they will be filled. Some, some translations actually translated as satisfied, but I know that you know that when you are filled, aren't you also then satisfied? Now I want you to think about something for a moment in the idea of the statement, you are what you eat. Have you heard of that statement, you are what you eat? I know that I've heard that statement before and when I think about it what I what I actually just had to eat today was actually a fig newton and so if I am what I eat I guess I would be a fig newton and so think about what that last thing that it is that you would you ate and can you imagine if you really truly were what you ate but I want you to think about the idea of that of that statement see because nutritionalists actually say that your appetite determines your diet your diet then determines your intake of what you put in your body and your intake actually determines your health, right? So when you are what you eat, when you're eating unhealthy, you will become unhealthy. When you are eating healthy, there is definitely a better chance that you will then become healthy, right? So what is it that you eat? But the idea of this too, is see, is when this scripture in Matthew 5, 6 says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, that actually comes from the spiritual sense right that's a spiritual realm and so the the next beatitude that it is that we're looking at in the hungering thirsting for righteousness we have to take a look at it that you and i are to have a spiritual appetite right a spiritual appetite and you're what is it to be for for righteousness we're going to dive in and take a look at what that means but let's go ahead and first close our eyes we're going to bow we're going to pray and then we'll dive in to what god has for us so let's pray heavenly father i thank you again Father, for this evening, I thank you, Father, for giving us the Beatitudes. I thank you for the Sermon on the Mount in which Jesus shared and taught on the Beatitudes, Father, of the idea of right living. And with right living comes right attitude, comes with a fruitful life, comes with a life that is reflective of you. But I lift up this time to you. May each of our viewers be blessed. May your name be lifted up on high. And so, Father, I just pray all these things in your name. Amen. Now, when you think of the blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, you have to take a look at the idea of what does it mean to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And I found this interesting as I continued on in the study of righteousness and there's various principles that go along with it. Now, did you know that the word righteousness only occurs one time in all the other four gospels? However, it occurs seven times in Matthew's gospel, right? Including five times in the Sermon on the Mount. Now the word is a mystery. It's a mystery to you, it's a mystery to us. What does it mean? 
but we know that it has something to do with right living, right? Doing right. And that's about it. That's about all that you and I know. But when we lift up the hood, we take a deeper look at this word. I believe that there's so much more to this word that, that you and I probably don't even really fully understand or grasp. When we look at scripture, it gives us a better idea. First off, when you take a look and see righteousness is a lifestyle that distinguishes you from from being, it distinguishes you from everybody else and it reflects you as being a true Christian and, and invites opposition from the world. Jesus in uh, Matthew 5.10 said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. See, now that's in the eighth and the 10th Beatitudes. So we're gonna be getting there, the final Beatitude, not the, not the 10th, but the final. See, now taking the fourth, which is one we're in right now, and the eighth Beatitude together, you get something like this. You are to hunger and thirst after a kind of life that will cause people to persecute you for your faith. So righteousness is a lifestyle that distinguishes you as true Christians and invites opposition from the world, as I just mentioned. But even beyond that, it becomes a heart issue. See, righteousness starts in the heart and it changes a person. It's supposed to change you from the inside out. And the second use of the word righteousness Jesus said this, and this is found in Matthew 5, 20. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The Pharisees had created their own idea of righteousness that consisted of an outward display of action where it was kind of like the look at me mentality. It was fueled by pride. The idea of what Jesus is saying is that it starts in the heart. It doesn't start on the outside. Your righteousness is not about the outward display of the look at me. It is on the inside and it changes you on the inside. See, righteousness doesn't need to be seen by others. It needs to be seen by God. And the third use of this word righteousness, Jesus says, be careful to not practice your righteousness in front of people to be seen by them. Otherwise, you will have no reward from your father in heaven. That comes from Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. The Pharisees lived a lifestyle, lived their lifestyle, seeking praise from others. And they didn't do it with the right heart and therefore wanted everybody else to see their good works. They wanted to see what they were doing. They loved dressing up in their fancy religious garments and throw their offering. They would actually throw their offering into a metal container so those around them could hear all the coins jarring around and twirling around within this metal container. But it was all fueled by pride. They didn't have the right heart with it, right? The only thing that needs to be seen is seen by God. You have to do it with that attitude. Your righteousness has to come from a place of humility and not from a place of pride. Righteousness then also causes you to seek God's approval above anything else. I know oftentimes I know for me, maybe for you, that we might seek the approval of people when ultimately the only approval you need is the one that comes from God right? In Matthew chapter 6 verse 33, this is what Jesus says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be provided or say added to you. This touches on the idea of prioritization. See, what are you seeking after life? Some people are seeking fame. Some people are seeking fortune and money. Some people might be seeking career advancement, a good, uh, good salary, a secure future a happy retirement. Some of you might be seeking after that perfect match of a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a husband and a wife, maybe that perfect friendship. You desire the fulfillment of your dreams. It's not that God doesn't desire you for you to have dreams or even have any of these things in your life, but none of them are more important than your relationship with God, right? And as though good as those things may be, they're not the most important things in life. Put God's kingdom and God's righteousness first. And when you do, everything you need will be supplied to you and probably even so much more. But he's saying seeking his righteousness means letting the word, letting his word, God's word, set the standard in your life. Another one of the core values, one core value we have at Crossroads is that the Bible is our ultimate authority. We look to the scriptures first for everything for all things, right? And so are you looking to the scripture and the scripture will set the standard by which you're to live your life. And that means that you're seeking to live a life that pleases him. See, but these four passages, when you put them together, what do you have? 
What do you thirst after? See, a truly a Christian lifestyle that changes you from the inside out means that you no longer seek the praises of men. You no longer seek the approval of men, women, anyone. You seek the approval of God. Ultimately, are you pleasing God? This standard, this requirement is available for everyone. It's available for you. It's avail available for me. In fact, Jesus clearly says that anyone who lives this kind of lifestyle out will be blessed, right? And his desire is that you're blessed. The next aspect of this is a power of hunger. Now, in the time in which Jesus, when he said this, the community, the culture that they were in, these people knew what it was like to be hungry. Do you know what it's like to be hungry? See, in, in, in that culture, most of the people there knew what it meant to go hungry and they were not prosperous. And more likely, at one time or another, they had experienced a hunger that you and I have probably never even experienced here, right? They lived in, pro in poverty without groceries. They didn't have grocery stores. They didn't have refrigerators. They didn't even have running water. They didn't have microwaves. They didn't have fast food restaurants. They didn't have a fraction of what it is that you and I have, which meant that they had to oftentimes go without, right? And oftentimes they would go more than one day without food. They were left with quite a bit of hunger pains. See, our hunger pains, your hunger pains and mine might mean we go without food for an hour or two. Their hunger pains means that they go without food for days. And I want you to think we have a department here, Global Outreach, and within that department, we have local outreach. And within local outreach, we have a food pantry. And many of you have actually donated to the food pantry because there's even people with inside of our community that are lucky to have one meal a day, right? Now, you understand it and I understand it that in our community, there's gonna be the poorer of neighborhoods. They're, they're the less fortunate, the down and outs, those who don't have the latest and the greatest, right? And at best, maybe only have one meal or maybe one pair of shoes. Now I want you to think about an area such as Kenya. Now we have a global outreach team that goes and visits Kenya. And, and there's children there who are a part of a school that, that when people, they adopt, they're adopting a child, right? They're sponsoring a child so that child can be in school. And so we have many members here of Crossroads who pay something like 35 or $40 a month. And what that supplies that one child is food, shelter, and, and, and schooling and an education. But they're lucky if they get one pair of shoes a day. I mean, not a day, a year, one pair of shoes. If you were to open up my closet, I have more shoes than I would ever know what to do with. And I don't, I don't even wear most of them. And yet they have one pair to last them all year. We truly are blessed in the culture it is that we, we live in. But I want you to ask yourselves, have you ever known true hunger? Like, like say people in Kenya, people in Africa, or how about maybe the people that live in an area here, even in Corona, that is absolutely less fortunate than you. See, in our culture, really, ultimately overall, what does hunger mean? It means waiting an extra 10 minutes for the rolls to come out of the oven. Maybe it means that the sensation and the hunger pains within you causes you to maybe want to stop at McDonald's for, for fries and a drink, even though maybe you just ate two hours ago and you're not really necessarily hungry, you just have a craving. Do you realize that here in the United States, you and me, all of us, we are, we represent some of, we are the best fed people on the face of the earth. And ultimately our problem isn't finding something to eat. It's actually losing the weight that comes, that losing the weight that we've gained from eating too much. We, we have a tendency to eat more than what it is that we need. Jesus uses the metaphor of eating and drinking as the motivating power to live a righteous life. Now, I'd like to make some observations to help you understand what a spiritual hunger looks like that would lead you into living a righteous life. First point is you have to want it. No one can force you to eat. Now, I don't have a problem eating. I know that I can eat. Can, I'm pretty sure how many of you, go ahead, put it in the chat, like to eat. It, it, I can even be full. And somebody says, you want this? I might eat it, right? But the reality is, is you can only lead a horse to water. You can't make them drink it. And in order for you to desire, have a spiritual hunger, you have to desire a spiritual hunger. I can't force you to read scripture. My goal, my hope, my prayer is that you desire to feast upon scripture. But in Psalm 63, 1, King David writes these words. He says, oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search you. My soul thirsts for you. 
my whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. He's saying where there's no water for my physical, my physical body to even have, I long and I thirst for you. Do you long and thirst for God? Hunger and thirst are intense desires. It is the same intensity that you need in seeking righteousness. Think about the day in which you haven't had breakfast, you haven't had lunch, and you are looking forward to dinner and you can't wait to eat. That's the same kind of intensity that, that Jesus desires for you to have when you hunger and thirst after righteousness. Do you have the true desperation for a truly Christian lifestyle that changes you from the inside out like we've talked about before? Again, so that you no longer seek to be satisfied and fulfilled from an earthly sense, from a material sense, and although your body does need food to sustain, the better food that's going to cause you to lead a different life and a better life and a godly life is a hunger and thirst after righteousness, right? Can you say to Jesus, I only want you? Can you say to Jesus that I not only want you, but I need you? And I know not only need you, but I want, I must have you. Are you at a place in your life where to not have Jesus would be would be the sky is falling, catastrophic. You could not go a moment without Jesus. Do you hunger and thirst for him so much that it's not just about a want, it's not just about a need, but it's about a must. You must have, you must desire Jesus. Second point is you have to take action. Appetites are not fulfilled until you actually do something about it. It's one thing to say that you desire a cheeseburger from McDonald's. It's another thing to actually have you get in your car, get in the car with your parents or your care providers or, or a team member, you get in your car, parents, you get in your car. It's one thing to say you desire it. It's another thing to actually go there and get it. It's one thing to say, I'm hungry. It's another thing to go to the refrigerator, open it up, take some food out and prepare it and then eat it. You have to take action, right? And, and from a spiritual sense, you have to go to the source. See at home, the source of your food might from just a, a very simple perspective is a refrigerator, or maybe it's the pantry. You want some chips, where do you go to the pantry? The pantry is the source from where the chips are, right? Maybe you're thirsty, where do you go for your drink? You go to the refrigerator, and then you go to the source for where that is. Where's the, maybe you're gonna get a glass of water, maybe you're gonna get a cup of juice. Whatever that is, you're gonna go to where it's at. When you hunger and you thirst for righteousness, you have to go to the source of where it's at. And you have to hunger and thirst for his righteousness, God's righteousness, right? Jesus says these words. He says, I am the bread of life. No one who comes to me will ever hunger again. And no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again, right? And St. Augustine said these words. He's, and he was right when he said them. He says, oh God, you have made us for yourself. And our hearts are restless until, until they find rest in you, right? You'll never be fully and completely and 100% satisfied or filled until you hunger and you thirst for him, for Jesus himself, right? And when you're spiritually hungry, you will come, you will go to the source of spiritual life in Jesus himself. He is a source of spiritual life. The third point is you have to keep coming back for more. Now, the idea of this is, is Jesus gave two clear things is you have to hunger and you have to thirst right? And that implies a continuous action. When you eat breakfast, you will hunger again for lunch. When you eat lunch, you'll hunger again for dinner. When you drink something, you will be satisfied in the moment, but you will thirst again. So Jesus uses the metaphor with this and the grammar in which he used it was in the present tense. So it's a continuous hungering and a continuous thirsting that as you are filled, you, you actually the more you desire to be filled, the more you will be filled, right? Now, John MacArthur says these words when the idea of this of being filled with his righteousness. It says, if you claim a relationship with Christ, but you are not hungering and thirsting for righteousness, you need to honestly question whether or not you truly know Christ. Do you desire his righteousness within you? Do you desire, do you hunger, do you thirst after it in such a way that every single day, you desire more and more and more of him. The other idea of this is that you have to eat the whole thing. Who here, like I know for me, usually when I have food on the plate, it's, it's hard to only leave half of it there. But the idea is you need to take the whole thing. Believers do not just seek bits and pieces of righteousness. They need to seek all of the righteousness of Christ. 
in their desire to be like him. When you seek to live a life that reflects the heart of Jesus, you're not, it's not enough to take a fraction, not enough to take 25% or 50%. His desire is that you desire everything, 100% and even beyond, right? And when you hunger for his righteousness, you will want and desire the must-have portion of all of God. In today's culture, we see so oftentimes people seek to do the bare minimum to get by. See, the idea is, is well, if I just skate into heaven, I'll be okay, right? And that's really not truly really what God desires for you. Are you desiring heaven so that way you avoid hell? You see, if you're desiring heaven so that you avoid hell, you're not looking to having all of him. Let's put the hell side apart. Desire all of him. Just desire all of him. Hunger and thirst for every single aspect of him. And what will be happen? What will happen ultimately is you will be filled. Right? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. You will be satisfied. Right? And there's you, you know, you're not gonna be filled. It's not an idea of being filled with money or with food or or with anything like that. The idea is is that you're gonna be filled with him. And when you're filled with him, all the other things will then become satisfying as well because you're filled with the righteousness, right? Now, the idea of this, I'm gonna give some phrases here for you to just think about, that if you want it, you can have it. If you want it, you can have a close walk with God. If you want it, you can have a close walk with God. If you want it, you could have, if you're married, a better marriage. Now, for our participants out there, people involved in the ministry, I know most all of you are not married, but you know, the idea of it is when you look to God first for his righteousness, he'll give you the better life. He'll give you that, right? If you want it, you can do God's will. Because if you go out, you hunger and thirst for his righteousness, you will seek to live according to his will. If you desire it and you want it, you can grow spiritually. But the way in which you grow spiritually is first you have to want it, you have to take action, and you have to continuously step into it. It's not a one-time deal, right? If you want to, you can become a man of God or a woman of God in such a way that reflects the heart of Christ. But you have to not just want it. You have to not just say you want it. Words aren't enough. It has to be followed up with the action, right? If you want it, you can change deeply ingrained habits. If you're looking to change something within you, if you desire to experience change, you can experience change. Question is, is do you truly desire that change? right? You can actually break destructive patterns with inside of your life. But remember, apart from Christ, you can do nothing. So you have to hunger and thirst for his righteousness because on your own, you will always be left lacking and wanting. But when you hunger and you thirst for righteousness, for his righteousness, and you're following it up with action and you're actually doing it, and it's a continuous one you're doing every single day, you can experience the things that it is that it is you desire. Why? Because he is living within you and you're tapping into his strength, right? And when you hunger and thirst after his righteousness, and when you want what God wants more than anything else in the world, you can have it, you can experience it. But it can't be you want money more than him. It can't be you want a relationship more than him. It can't be you're gonna live according to your own will, but yet you still want all the benefits and the blessings that he has for you. No, you have to hunger and thirst for his righteousness and you will be filled, right? Scripture tells us, if you are hungry, come and eat of the bread of life. Who's the bread of life? Jesus. Jesus is the bread of life. Scripture says, if you are thirsty, come and drink of the water of life. Who's the water of life? Jesus is the water of life. Scripture says, if you are weary and heavy laden, come and find rest. Where do you find your rest? In Jesus Christ says, if you are guilty, come and be forgiven. Where does your forgiveness come from? It comes again from Jesus Christ. It says, if you are far from God, come home again. And from whom do you go? Whom do you go through? His son, Jesus Christ. See, when you have Jesus, you will be changed by Jesus and you will be filled. And once you are filled, you will then live a fulfilled life. The idea is that you and I are supposed to desire, the goal is to desire, to, to live a life that is a fulfilled life. But you can only live that fulfilled life when you hunger and you thirst after his righteousness, and then you will be filled. See, so in that scripture in Matthew 5, 
verse 6, right? When it says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they will be filled. They will be satisfied. You will be filled and satisfied. And so this was the, was the beatitude where all of a sudden now you're going to experience something incredible, right? You're not just going to have it. You're going to experience it. You're going to have a satisfaction and a contentment with inside of your life that is apart from the idea of having to have more. And God desires for you to have he doesn't, it's not that he's opposed to you having nice things, but you cannot have nice things and have them before God. You cannot have wants and desires and have your wants and desires before God. His desire is that he is first. And when he is first and you seek to have all of him, you will be filled like never before and your cup will actually be overflowing. Have you experienced that kind of satisfaction yet? That kind of spiritual satisfaction within, within the depths of your soul? pray that's something that you desire and I pray that that is something that you you actually experience and if you haven't experienced it I pray you begin to experience it see these are building blocks the Beatitudes are building blocks upon each week is a building block upon the previous week in order you're just moving your inch and you're, you're stepping yourself closer into the idea of living a deeper relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ next week we're gonna we're gonna touch on the next Beatitude but this one, this week, I pray that you just start thinking about how much you're hungering and you're thirsting for his righteousness and having it ingrained with inside of you toward now as you hunger and you thirst for it, you become filled by it. And as you're filled by it, you, you are now beginning to more and more live the kind of lifestyle, have the kind of attitude and experience the kind of life that he desires for you. But I want to thank you again for tuning in with us this evening. And I hope that you have an amazing week. And may you know the God, creator of the heavens and the earth, the God who put you, wombed you, just tied you together, created you in your mother's womb. That you were created in his image. And he couldn't love you more than he does right now. And his desire for you is that your life is incredible as you seek to grow in relationship with him through his son. But may you have a blessed week and we'll see you all again next week. I'm going to go ahead and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for, for our time together and learning more about what it means just to hunger and thirst for your righteousness. I pray that's something that we all can hunger and thirst after, Father God, as we seek to put you first in our lives. And may your, may your name, may who you are, continuously be lifted up on high, Father God. In your name, amen. Hey, again, if you haven't subscribed to our channel, please feel free. We'd love to have you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. But like I previously said, I hope you have the most incredible week, and I look forward to seeing you all again next week. God bless. Thank you so much guys for tuning in. Oh, what, say something in rebuttal, sorry.